Hello and welcome to series weekly winter webinars. We've got some fabulous um, panelists for you today, the first of the si in, of four of a, a series in June, um, for how to permaculture your way out of a crisis. We have Kerry Shiravalis, Shura um, Kat, Kat Lavers and Ben Habib. Um, so we welcome you today and um, before we start the session, I would like to acknowledge um, the elders of this land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd also like to ask some people to add the land on which they're standing and I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And I also want to comment on the um, um, Indigenous elders and their sharing of knowledge with their community and that's something that we're attempting to do today with you. Thank you for coming along and attending um, this webinar series and I hope that we share nourishing and community healing um, information for you to how, to how to deal with our current crises. I want to acknowledge that we're in a climate and an ecological crisis at the moment. As an organisation at the end of last year's series um, made a declaration, formal declaration of the climate and ecological crisis and uh, we aim in everything we need to do to make an impact, a positive impact um, in terms of this crisis. I also want to acknowledge that we're in the intersection of multiple crises. Um, we have a social health and economic crisis going on at the moment as well as an environmental crisis and that there's lots of challenges as a community that we're facing and as a global community that we're facing, which is reflective in terms of current things that are emerging. Um, and some of these topics will probably come out in our responses today and the expertise we have in the room. At Ceres, where our vision as an organisation is to help people fall in love with the earth again. And we do this through our social enterprises, our education programs, and providing a place for people to engage with. Today, it is our school and education programs um, that these webinars are brought to you for, and one of our mechanisms of helping people um, connect with um, themselves, others, and the earth, and um, to help fall in love with the earth again. So the Ceres School of Nature and Climate embodies all of our education programs at Ceres. It, it steeps from deep rooted values in learning design um, that nourish into the trunk of our tree, which is our vision linked to series vision, which is to help people learning to love the earth. Um, then we have different mechanisms in which we can learn from the earth. We can learn from the earth, with the earth, with people and um, you know, group knowledge and embedded ancient and cultural knowledge and, and for the earth and everything we construct and do as well. These webinar series are actually taken from the branches of our trees. These branches of our trees are our learning areas that we have collectively chosen as a focus area to create impact um, in terms of the School of Nature and Climate, which is a response to the climate ecological crisis. Um, each branch um, hopes to share knowledge with our, our learning community. Our first um, webinar is permaculture. Um, the one next week is going to be on regenerative agri uh, agriculture. Um, the one following that is new economies and looking at real life um, localization and um, transformation of communities. And the final one in June is climate and natural systems before we kick off um, the rest of winter. Um, thank you for, so much um, for um, coming and celebrating in our School of Nature and Climate together as a learning community. I'm really proud to share our current vision as a school and as a learning provider. Today, as you know, you've come along to um, talk about permaculture and how to permaculture your way out of crisis. So without further ado, let's delve into this topic. Um, now, we'll, as I mentioned, we have the three speakers here today. Um, we're going to start with Kat, um, then have Ben, and then speak with Kerry. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kat Lavers, and then I'll throw it over to her. Um, each presenter will be presenting for five, you know, five to ten minutes at a time about this topic and then we're going to open it up to the, the, com the community to ask questions. You'll be, um, if, you have, if you want to respond to any questions we ask, please put it in the chat. Otherwise, um, please use the Q&A um, on the function of the Zoom webinar. Um, thank you again for coming today. Um, um, Kat Labors, local legend. She's a passionate gardener and sustainable food systems advocate. Um, and she's, she's a fantastic teacher and educator and has so many skills in facilitation. Um, and she's one of our fabulous PDC educators here at Ceres. 
Um, and we're very lucky to have her as part of a team of fantastic PDC educators. Um, and she also um, does a lot of her own workshops and sessions as well. Um, she runs um, the Plumbery, which is her place just around the corner um, in, in Northcote, which is fantastic um, display of urban ag in her backyard and permaculture. So she lives it, she walks the talk. Um, so her work reconnects people with the land under their feet and helps them to experience the abundance of growing food as well as their role in wider ecosystems. I'm really glad to welcome Kat Lavers. Um, please now Kat, um, share with us your introduction of this session today. Now, so much more than we've, we've known um, for you know, my, my lifetime, that the story really of how the land is managed has, has really opened up thanks to the work of people like Bruce Pascoe and Bill Gamage. And I think we're only just starting to understand what a clever system of design uh, was in place uh, before European settlement. Uh, so I just want to start by acknowledging that before we go any further as well. Yeah, so I'm a permaculture teacher and I'm very interested in food systems and particularly the role that a household can play and a community can play in the um, piece of a bigger food systems puzzle. And um, I like the title of this event, uh, How to Permaculture Your Way Out of a Crisis. I also think that permaculture is, um, it, it can never be the whole solution, of course. So that's important to say. It's not the holy grail and uh, there are other areas which need a lot of attention, such as some of the injustice that's happening and the activism that needs to respond to that. But insofar as it can help households to build resilience uh, and help communities and ecosystems to become stronger and healthier and help reduce people's reliance on these bigger, more damaging systems and protect the things that really matter like soil and water and biodiversity and community. I think that permaculture has a huge role to play in the solutions. So um, well, the last couple of years have really been for me about um, documenting the place that I live that we call the plumbery. And I guess trying to contribute to this evidence base that households can be a really significant part of the answer um, for how we wanna live our lives with less impact on the earth. And um, the, the pandemic has been really interesting for us. And I suppose that there's definitely been ups and downs around here, uh, but I do need to say we're in a really privileged and very stable situation that I'm deeply grateful for. And um, it's certainly been an easy ride for us compared to many of our friends and family and neighbors. Um, it turns out the plumbery is a really good place to be stuck for a few months. And um, the other thing that's been really interesting besides testing out some of the, the things that we have in place here, uh, just the surge in demand um, very suddenly for requests for uh, advice and for seeds and just the wave of interest and spotlight that suddenly come on these things that we've been doing for quite some time. Um, so uh, you've asked us to just talk a little bit about how we're responding to this crisis. And I guess in a very local sense, of course, I've been doing what I presume um, most people listening have been doing and getting in touch with neighbours and deepening those connections, um, you know, giving care packs of, of food and things to the people I know who need them and checking in on neighbours, but also trying to respond at a slightly larger community scale through, um, for example, some Facebook Live events, just going through the main topics that people were um, asking lots and lots of questions about and becoming a, a source of seeds really um, and being able to save a lot of seeds and distribute them out to people who are having trouble accessing them um, either because they're not there on the shelves or because financially they're just a bit too much of an investment. Um, so this is just a little taste I guess of what we've been up to and I'm certainly looking forward to hearing from Kerry and Ben uh, and from uh, the group of people listening in as well. Thank you so much, Kat, um, um, for your introduction. And I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions for you, but we're going to hold off until all three speakers um, start. I'd now like to introduce, if you could press mute, Kat, um, I now would like to introduce um, our next speaker. Um, and we, we've heard from Kat. And now I'd like to introduce um, Ben Habib. Uh, it's actually Dr. Benjamin Habib. He's a lecturer in politics and international relations at La Trobe Uni University. Um, ben is an internationally published scholar with current research interests in intersections between grassroots sustainability and regen projects, environmental movements and international climate politics. What rich topics there 
Ben actually did his first his PDC at series and since has become one of our PDC um, educators as well. And I know also you've been part of the Permaculture Australia Board and other um, environmental um, education organisations boards as well. But without further ado, you don't want to hear from me. Um, here is Ben Habib to respond to the same question. Thank you. Thanks, Lorna. And thanks to Kat and Kerry for being with me on the panel today. So I know that my academic bio makes me sound a little bit wanky, but basically I I'm, I'm provide a big picture perspective because I'm an international relations specialist by training. So I provide the, the big picture pattern perspective on permaculture movement and sort of locate what we're doing, you know, in sort of local to national and international systems. And wow, from that perspective, what a year 2020 has been. And I've just been glued to Twitter over the last week, you know, my heart breaking, seeing what's happening in the United States. Uh, and just seeing that as that's what the politics of ecological crisis uh, and breakdown looks like when there's not good resilience in a society. And so if we look at what's happening in the United States, that's a lesson for us about the importance of not just having a really good permaculture garden, not just having a passive solar house, not just getting out of the city to have a, a block out in Castlemaine. Uh, it's about true resilience is about justice and a resilient society is a just society. So as permaculture practitioners, you know, we kind of have an obligation to our core ethics of earth care, people care and fair share to put those into practice. And so we have to think about how we do that at scales beyond just what's immediately in front of us. But having said that, there's also a lot of self work that we need to do in order to be constructive members of the community and not, you know, to be frank, projecting our baggage and projecting our shit onto other people. So we've got to own where we're coming from uh, so that we can be part, a healthy part of the, the broader social ecosystems that we want to be part of. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from, and I'm sure we can sort of flesh that out a bit more in the Q&A. Uh, but also, if we don't have time and you've got questions for me, please, please feel free to get in touch. Send me an email. I'm easy to find on social media. Thank you, Ben. And uh, if you could press mute, I'm going to move on to introducing the next speaker. They're... they're they just want to get to the conversation. I know it. They're doing short intros just so that they can talk to everyone else here. Um, I'm going to now introduce our third and final panelist. Um, and and I've, I forgot to change her name. It is a double L in Kerry um, um, Sheravalis. Kerry is a cultural anthropologist with an interest in environmental anthropology, um, social movement studies and theories of social change. She was key in developing and coordinating one of the world's first tertiary level permaculture programs. And she's also got a doctorate in anthropology, social inquiry at University of Adelaide. She also um, works as a consultant and um, design, uh, educational designer as Dream Awake. And please correct me in the last bit because I'm improving at the end, um, um, Kerry. I know that Ben, who's attending in the audience, will share a link to the work that you're doing. But if you want to add a little bit more, that would be great to flesh that out. Um, without further and look, she's she's there with um, the 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 granddaddy or godfather of permaculture, David Holgram. So she's got contacts contacts in the biz. Let's let's hear a bit more from Kerry now. Hello, Kerry. Thanks so much, Lorna, and um, thanks to Ben and Kat for your awesome uh, introductions to this topic as well. Um, yeah, I am a recovering academic, as Lorna has stated, um, and currently have uh, my own research and education consultancy called Dream Awake Research, Education and Design, and it focuses on research and education beyond sustainability. Um, part of that is through my involvement with Permaculture SA, and um, projects like the 52 Climate Actions Project, which was a large international permaculture collaboration, um, but also teaching things like Living Smart courses. Um, we've got some 52 Climate Actions workshops coming up and things like that as well. 
Um, I'd also like to start by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the shared lands of the Ghana and Paramung people in the Adelaide Hills and um, extend my respect to elders past, present and emerging, as well as to any First Nations people who might be joining us um, or watching this back um, later on. Uh, in terms of permaculturing our way out of a crisis, well, what a question. Um, I think we have to obviously relate all of this back to the core ethics, as Ben said, of earth care, people care and fair share. And of course, this fair share aspect of it all is becoming more and more apparent and obvious um, as we see the ways that um, this crisis has uh, disproportionately and um, differentially impacted particular groups and as we see um, all of the horrific things that are going on in the US at the moment um, and it makes us more aware of the injustices that have been taking place um, for decades and indeed centuries here in Australia as well. Um, my background as Lorna mentioned is in cultural anthropology um, so when I think about um, permaculture I'm often really aware of the contradictions that are embodied in the concept and in the movement and um, one of the most obvious of these is the idea of pursuing a permanent culture. Um, as a cultural anthropologist of course I'm very aware that culture is always in a state of flux, it's always changing, it's always evolving, so there really is no such thing as a permanent culture. Of course what we are aiming for as a permaculture movement um, isn't some kind of static culture but a kind of culture that we could um, sustain and that can sustain us. So we're aiming at a regenerative culture. Um, but I think the pace of change in terms of asking us to reflect on our own experience here um, is, is really relevant to this question. I mean, I feel like, yes, culture is always changing, but at the moment, um, the pace of change has just been so rapid and so extreme. I don't know how all of you are feeling, but I know I'm struggling. <laughs> Um, constantly to keep up with the pace of change to process the things that are taking place and the new information we're being constantly exposed to and I think in this context it's the care elements of permaculture and those ethics that I think become more and more important um, focusing on thinking about what a regenerative culture might actually look like um, and how we can prioritize care for one another care for earth um, and our own well-being as we adjust to this crisis. I've got lots of different ideas and suggestions on how we can go about doing that. Um, and one of the key things I want to emphasize is the dual nature of this crisis, of crisis itself actually. Um, you've probably, a lot of you have seen Naomi Klein's reflections on this. Um, it's important to acknowledge that crisis presents us with possibility. Um, we've seen a whole bunch of cracks emerging in the system that we've known have been there for a while and they've been widened and opened up and it's creating space for possibility, new light to shine in through those cracks. Um, but there's also great danger in these times of crisis and Naomi Klein has talked about, um, you know, coronavirus capitalism, disaster capitalism, the fact that while, of these, while all these things are taking place, while people are distracted and scrambling to deal with disaster, um, extreme ideas can come um, through, extreme policies can be introduced while people are distracted. Um, there's a space to entertain more extreme policies. So I think there's a real need for us to keep an awareness of this, um, keep an awareness of how our actions and thoughts and ideas can be playing towards either side um, and to be aware of those dangers while looking for spaces of hope. Um, and hopefully, <laughs> we can uh, turn in our discussions to talking about um, what those spaces of hope look like. And I've taken a lot of inspiration from the people in this panel um, with regards to that. Ben's work on social permaculture, um, Kat's incredible work at the Plumery. Um, and I think, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot of wonderful things happening at the moment in terms of, you know, the viral kindness movement, that ethic of care being spread around and acted upon. Um, the way that people are grabbing at these opportunities, seeds are selling out, all these wonderful things are happening. Um, so there are so many ways that we can creatively use and respond to this change. And key to that, I think, is going to be collaboration. So I'll <laughs> wind up there and um, look forward to hearing from everybody else. Thanks. 
Hi, thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a great introduction from a wealth of knowledge there um, from our permaculture community. If I could get all the panellists to um, take their mutes off, I've got a couple of leading questions and then audience, I'm going to throw over to you and hopefully the intros have, um, have been thought provoking and you've got questions ready to go. Um, feel free to start entering them in the q and I'm going to ask a few questions and I'll just get each of you to answer or um, whoever feels the need to answer. We don't have to answer every question as panellists. So the first question is, that, um, and some of you have already answered this one a little bit, it was prepared earlier. Um, we, the conversation around, you know, the world is um, facing multiple crises in this time of the virus and challenges at the moment. Um, and, you know, we touched on the protest in the US and the appendix, um, global economic depression. Wow. What permaculture principles can be applied to this big picture challenge? So we've, I've mentioned the care elements. Is there anything else we can add? So what permaculture principles can we use, collectively use, to help us through this and get to the other side um, in, in terms of solutions and um, theory behind that as well? Um, maybe first I could chat to Kat. <laughs> That's a huge question, Lorna. I'd say they're all helpful in their own way. Just uh, pick, a, pick a context and uh, we could start brainstorming them. But, you know, the one that's really uh, struck first when you mentioned that was integrate rather than segregate and this idea that we more than ever need to be working um, together rather than isolating ourselves, even though, of course, we must remain physically distanced, um, that the social distancing doesn't necessarily have to happen. We can be socially unified and um, integrated uh, while keeping our physical distance at this time. Okay, um, fantastic. So, yeah, collaborating while we're not together in the room, and I think Kerry touched on that one before as well. Thanks, Kat. Um, what do you think, Ben? Yeah, just from what I've seen across the movement, so I'm looking at what permies are doing, not just here in Oz, but you know, in other places around the world. And I've been lucky enough to interview a lot of people uh, who are doing permaculture practice. And in a lot of contexts where survival is their main thing, not just, you know, that's not quite the imperative that we've been facing. But there's a few main strands, and one of them is relocalization. So being able to relocalize our supply networks, where we get stuff from, you know, this the seeds of that idea go way back to the very beginnings of permaculture. So it's all there. Uh, and but also drawing on the power of, of networks. And so if you're going to relocalize, that's not squirreling away into a little hole and isolating yourself uh, in a community away from everyone else. It's being networked with other people that are doing relocalization as well. So getting the best out of going local, but also having really strong connections further afield so that you can help each other out. And that's, that's a really difficult thing to do. It's kind of, yeah. so, and uh, also the final thing is having some control over your means of subsistence so that you don't have to buy everything, that you can produce uh, the things you need yourself or locally. Uh, and disconnect from having to rely on the market to get everything. Cause in a, you know, in bad economy, that's a really key vulnerability. So what those things look like for you depends on who you are, where you are and what resources you've got. And that's where the permaculture design thinking can help you flesh out what your exact strategies need to be. Okay, thank you, Ben. Carrie, do you have anything to add to these great responses? Absolutely, I agree with both of your responses. Um, I think integrate rather than segregate is key. Collaboration is absolutely key. Um, because the scale of response that is required right now is so urgent and so large, um, it's really important that we're not um, trying to reinvent the wheel on our own and doing things that other people are doing elsewhere um, where we could be connecting and, and um, supporting each other and um, utilising each other's energy that's, that's already been spent. Um, so I think that's key. And I think it's really important for permaculture to be connecting with... Um, uh, with other groups, um, perhaps outside of permaculture that have been working towards the same ends um, for a long time um, and to support um, uh, and collaborate with them uh, in a better way. One, one of the key things that I've loved seeing at the moment is something that's being highlighted in the chat now, 
is the emergence of the permaculture crisis and response group that's really put um, decolonization at the center, um, which I think is just so important moving um, forward. And of course, we've just seen someone put creatively use and respond to change in there, which was the next thing I was gonna highlight as well. We have um, such an opportunity here and um, I think part of that um, really needs to be applied in how we look at connecting and collaborating into the future. Um, it's been something I've been putting a lot of thought into as we've been moving a lot of our courses um, online and sessions and, and things like this uh, online where we used to deliver them face to face and thinking about what are the implications of that in terms of um, inclusivity um, and like how can there's so many wonderful things about it in terms of saving on carbon emissions enabling a lot of people to participate that might not otherwise have been able to, but there are also equity implications of that too. Um, so I think it's important to think about new hybrid ways of interacting with each other and really changing the way that we organise as a movement. Um, mm. And the, the third one I wanted to highlight is small and slow solutions, because I feel like there's this tendency, it's like we know how urgent everything is. Um, and there's such a tendency towards burnout in the permaculture and activist world um, because people care so deeply and they want to make change so much um, but it, it is really important to be looking after ourselves and I guess giving what we can um, and trying to, to move things forward slowly and realizing we don't have to do everything on our own we're supported by each other and we can help each other move forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, um, everyone, for answering that question. We're starting to get questions now from the audience. Um, we have a question from um, Keegan Daly and from Rachel Goldlust. If you want to ask it yourself, I would love to hear your voice. It's nice to hear people's voices as well instead of me reading out. Raise your hand and Sita will un, um, um, give you the mic, um, the Zoom mic. It's like just pretend we're running down the, um, the aisle in our, our forum at the moment. So, um, so you'd be able to answer them yourself. Bear with me. And while um, Cedar is doing that, I'm going to ask another question. So there's no dead air time, um, um, just while she's preparing the mic for you. Um, so we've noticed a real shift even in our enterprises through this time of crisis, through um, you know seedlings being sold up in the nursery and more organic um, food and bulk food being bought over the last few months. Um, so, and also we, we're assuming lots of time at home means lots of DIY projects and attention to um, given to our gardens. Um, do you think we are already on the permaculture road out of this? Um, do you feel that? I know that you touched on that a bit before, Kat, but who would like to respond to that question? Are we on, do you feel like we're on the road and how do we keep people on this road if we are? Is that one for me, Lorna? Yeah, for it, Kat. Go. yeah, I mean, um, there's this fantastic quote by an American um, science fiction writer, William Gibson, that I think about a lot. And he likes to say the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. And I felt that for such a long time. There are so many examples out there, but a lot of them have been behind the scenes and not well documented and not um, shared publicly. And I feel what's happening at the moment is people are sharing a bit more and awareness is growing of what, what's actually out there in the community, which is not to say we haven't got such a long way to go, because of course we have. Um, but I think really we're, we're just seeing a lot more attention on the things that are already there. Um, so keeping going, <laughs> keeping going and encouraging people to give it a go who aren't yet there is, um, I think, that the next step. Um, and looking at some of the questions that are starting to pop up in the chat and um, I guess what aspects of social permaculture are relevant to be thinking about at this time. Um, one thing that comes from my background of behaviour change work is thinking around some of um, the evidence around how and why people change their behaviour. And a lot of that research boils back to um, social norms and people being very um, connected social creatures and looking to others for cues around how to act um, at this time. And um, so one of the things I think about with my work is how to make visible what I'm doing <laughs> and um, how to do it in a way which um, kind of shows people that it's a normal thing to do. And not only normal, but also in many cases, something that is enriching your life and um, giving you joy as well. Yeah. Um, and again, I, like, I'm always conscious about promoting permaculture as, you know, yay, fun, happy, <laughs> you know, and there are many actions that need to happen that are difficult challenging a real struggle to continue 
Um, and of course, I'm thinking about some of the activism that's so desperately needed at this time in there as well. But um, as much as we can, living what we believe in and doing so in a way that's as visible as possible, just to encourage the next person on the street who walks past you to maybe think about giving it a go as well, um, is I guess an easy step, um, but something that I think uh, would help contribute to that social norm building that's going on at the moment. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Kat. Um, ben or Kerry, if you would like to also add, or do you think she covered it? Uh, I Yeah, I fully endorse what Kat's just said. What's, what's been pleasing for me to see through the, the COVID crisis is that permies have stepped up and there's lots of us in our movement that have come online and shared our knowledge uh, and there's such a wealth of knowledge. And in this, yeah. in this crisis situation, yeah. You know, it's very disorienting for most people because you know, ordinary ways of doing things are breaking down and people want to know what to do. And permies, we have a plan. We've been planning for this moment for 30 years, 40 years, right? So people are, some people are going to gravitate to us because we have a, a plan for a pathway forward. And that, you know, this is something that's already happening. Permaculture practitioners are stepping into the, into the breach and, and coming forward with strategies. Uh, to to adapt to this time, which is amazing. Thank you, Ben. Um, um, Kerry, if you don't mind, I'm going to move on now because I know we've got five questions from the people um, from the community. Um, Rachel Goldlass, are you happy for me to pass you to the mic? Would you? Um, I'm just I'm doing that right now. So you're currently able to speak and ask your question around gender and race and class um, in the crisis response. So um, please talk now, if you can. If not, I'll read out your question. Sorry, hi Lorna. Hi Rachel, how are you? Would you like to read your question? I didn't realise I'd have to speak. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've just been, thank you everyone, really interesting panel. Um, I've just been, was just listening to, you know, a lot of discussion about inclusivity when it comes to recognition of indigenous and or, you know, different race issues, but there's been a lot of discussion during COVID around care work and a lot of the extra responsibilities falling to women. So I was interested in your response about how permaculture is addressing kind of gender inequity and then class is another one on top of that. Thank you. Easy question from Rachel there guys um, to respond to. I think it's a great one. Um, I'm gonna pass to Kerry as our um, um, anthropologist in the room. Maybe she's got a good response. Uh, thanks so much, Rachel, for such a fantastic and important question um, at the moment. It is absolutely key to uh, the issues that we're grappling with um, at the moment. And, you know, it's been wonderful to see um, such widespread uptake of work in reinforcing local and household economies and engaging in this care work that really is activism. Um, the earth care, the people care, the fair share. Um, Unfortunately, studies have shown that this is um, disproportionately engaged in um, by women um, and that there have tended to be um, a lot of the sort of power issues associated with um, patriarchy and masculinity reflected within the permaculture movement itself. So, of course, these are issues we need to be reflecting on constantly. Um, I think particularly as we think about um, holding these cracks open long enough to allow um, the positive changes that are being made to become habit, what that means in terms of the pushes we're all going to be um, coming up against now to snap things back um, to the way that they were before, um, to uh, re-establish the old patterns of the exploitative economies that we're engaged in um, and how we push back against that and, um, you know, that's an important part is changing the way that we value this work um, that was traditionally um, understood in a gendered way as women's work um, and find ways to revalue um, this focus on well-being, this focus on care and reprioritize it. Um, I was reading an excellent article on this issue yesterday that I've just posted in the chat um, by Rebecca Solnit. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear thoughts from the other panelists as well. Thanks, Kerry. Um, ben. Kat, do you want to go first before me? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess I 
it's not an area of particular expertise for me, but I do agree. Like there, there is a, a burden of care that more than often, often than not seems to fall on women. Um, yeah, so all I can say is that the blokes out there, be, be aware of that and, uh, <laughs> so, you know, look for ways that you can take some of that load and, and, and try out some new things during this time when we are, I guess, predisposed to letting go of old habits and picking up new ones just because of the um, particular um, interesting situation that we're in. Thanks, Kat. Ben, did you want to add more or would you like to move on to the next question? I'll just quickly jump in. I think, yeah, there's an obligation for anyone who's on the sort of the winning side of the power hierarchy to really look in the mirror and ask hard questions of yourself about how you benefit from that and what you need to do in order to flatten that power hierarchy. You know, so for me, I'm a guy. What are, what are my obligations as a male to be able to flatten the gender hierarchy? I'm white. What are my obligations as a white person uh, in a settler colonial country to flatten that hierarchy. Uh, I'm relatively well off. What are my obligations as a person in the middle class uh, to people who aren't as well off as, as I am? You know, these are hard questions and we can't shirk from them. We have to do that hard work. And this is part of the self-work. Yeah, if you want to embody the permaculture ethics this is the work you have to do now i'm not claiming that i'm a beacon of perfection in doing this i'm just as flawed as everyone else right but i think this is the work that we each of us have to do well said everyone in the panel thank you um i'm um keegan daly who's the um, um the organizer of the crisis response group has got a couple of questions keegan i'm about to put you on the mic sorry i'm putting people on the spot here um um, you can say, oh, I'd prefer you to um, read it out yourself, but I'm allowing you to talk right now. Hello, Keegan. Hi, everyone. Hi, you've got a couple of questions, so you can choose which one you'd like to ask. Welcome. Thank you. Um, it seems that permaculture has uh, sometimes failed in its ability to um, mobilise as a group, so failing in the realm of, of social permaculture. I know there has been a lot of work done in this area over the past few years as we've realised that a lot of our projects fail because of um, interpersonal relationships. So in that, there seems to be a lack of um, processes and ways to make decisions that can, can grow the movement in a way that doesn't segregate people based on idiosyncrasies and location. So I was just wondering what people's thoughts are around how we develop a movement that um, doesn't end up being um, focused on self-reliance, but actually seeks to empower one another, um, especially people who are um, less privileged and oppressed. I'm gonna let anyone, everyone popcorn and jump in on that one. I, I can kick off on that one. I, I absolutely agree with you, Keegan. And um, there, there's just a couple of resources that sprung to mind as you were talking that I'd like to mention. Uh, one of them is a book by a woman called Glenn Oker, um, who sadly left us a few years ago, but left behind an incredible legacy around how to do um, collaborative modes of facilitation that really tackle some of those issues that you raised around all of our own idiosyncrasies and how can we learn to work together in a constructive, smoother way uh, so that we get some of these other outcomes on the projects that we care about. So her book is called Getting Our Act Together. And she also left behind the Group Work Institute, now the Group Work Centre, uh, which if anyone ever does get a chance to do any training with them, uh, they just do some really, really high quality work at skilling up facilitators um, for social justice and environmental justice projects. So I really um, encourage people to check out that book and that work as well. And um, I also put in the, the uh, Q&A, or sorry, the chat window, um, the book called Me and White Supremacy. And um, just these questions of privilege that you know, they're uncomfortable, but they're so important. And it's a learning journey that we're all on. I'm learning, you know, I, I make mistakes all the time, um, but starting to become aware of some of those mistakes is I think the first part of the journey and then look at how we can build that into our work. Uh, and so that was um, kind of an online course that 
the author was running and now I've noticed is a book as well. And that's been a great starting point actually um, for me personally, thinking about those questions. Um, and then to the question around how do we help people who are um, less privileged and perhaps not available, or not able to afford courses or materials and um, tools and seeds. And I guess that is looking at all of our own individual contexts and going, well, what, what can I offer? How can I be of service in that situation? Um, and, I, you know, I guess for myself personally, I've been starting to do some work with refugees um, alongside Rosemary Morrow and look at how I can support, um, although that's become, of course, a lot more difficult now that international travel is very squarely off the radar. Um, but, yeah, looking locally and going, well, where are the um, networks that are already doing great work and how can I get behind them and support them? Um, for example, got a local agency in the city of Darabin where I live called Diverse, who do great food systems work, distributing food parcels and growing food for people in need. Um, and that's one of the places that I'm going to be delivering a lot of seeds tomorrow, for example. Uh, so we can't always coordinate everyone all together, but we can all contribute to local networks and integrate ourselves into them. And uh, that's a great thing to be doing at this time. Thanks, Kat. Um, Carrie or Ben, would you like to respond? Yeah, I will. Carrie, do you want to go first? No, you can go, Ben. Yeah, uh, yeah a lot of people come to permaculture uh, because they're just jack of the trauma of being in hierarchical situations, in, in hierarchical organisations, whether it's at work or, you know, think of all of the different places in our society where we have to be part of an authoritarian hierarchy and that's in almost any situation where we have to be a part of or engage in a large organization so a lot of us come to permaculture thinking we're sick of this it's hurting us and it's hurting the other people around us uh, and we end up going okay we don't want hierarchy so let's just free range it and be a bit anarchic well that doesn't work either the antidote to hierarchical organization is not no organization. It's coming up with a, a horizontal model of organization. And there's lots of, uh, you know, different models of horizontal organizing, uh, whether it's for small groups, you know, right up to bigger organizations. So that's sort of, it's not permaculture per se, but it's very allied to the permaculture ethics uh, that we can draw on in order to do this work properly. So, we do need some kind of governance system in order to deal with the, the power hierarchies between people because we can't, you can't just free range and it's not how interpersonal relationships work. You need a way to govern the differences between people and there are lots of good systems for doing that. Yeah, oh, really, really important points. And I, I just want to add to that just how important, um, I think in this context, the work that Ben was alluding to before um, that we all need to do in terms of confronting and challenging power structures as they're reflected in our own um, attitudes and practices is, um, is key to this. Um, and that because we are um, trying to overcome so many entrenched systemic issues and we are trying to respond creatively and trial different ways of approaching um, these things, that um, it's just so important to... Um, embed that ethic of care and kindness in interactions as well and to appreciate that people are all at different stages on this journey, um, that if they're showing up and they're trying, um, that's really important um, to recognise and value. Um, and I'll just point out a few resources in this space um, that have come out of or are allied with permaculture as well. So there's the whole um, sociocracy approach to decision making and a lot of star hawks work in this space, the empowerment manual approaches to consensus based decision making um, that have come out of and inspired a lot of activist movements as well. Fantastic. Thank you, panel. We have lots of questions now here. I've got a question from Sonia. Um, that is an interesting one about energy. Um, Sonia, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put you on the mic. If you're still in the house, you'll just hey, be yep. you? Hi, not bad. Um, sorry if you can hear the four year old in the background. I, I was just um, asking a question about, uh, this probably comes from fear from social change. Um, and people's perception of 
of the greener lifestyle. So um, do you recognise or get, do you recognise any limitations to a medical response in terms of pandemics or in terms of chronic illness like cancers and and such um, in an energy sense or permaculture world? That's it. Thank you, Sonia. Quite topical right now. Um, would anyone want to respond to that balance of energy and health um, in our health system? Yeah, I might uh, let me jump in on that one. Oh, Kat, do you want to go? No, I was just going to ask for a little clarification. Is it how we adapt our medical systems to an energy descent future? Um, is that the question? <laughs> Uh, yeah, a little bit, how we adapt, how we see that changing over time in an energy descent future, how we see uh, if we have less energy, if we have less globalisation, uh, will we be able to react to pandemics like COVID? Um, and this is a question in response to, you know, how do I answer this when people say, you know, yeah, good on you for going sustainability, but what if, you know, you know this, this is a fear people have, the more sustainability, the more green we go, do we uh, sacrifice uh, things like the medical system? The future question there, um, I'd love to hear the response. Yeah, I, I'm gonna come at this from the perspective of a lot of the, the conspiracy theories going around about 5G at the moment, some of which has infiltrated our movement. Uh, now, there's lots about the medical system that's really corrupt and destructive. And Big Pharma, you know, they're parasites uh, on people and economy. But there's a lot of medical knowledge from Western medicine that we need to keep uh, and we need to draw on. Having said that, there's also loads of knowledge from other knowledge systems, from traditional knowledge systems around the world that we also need to integrate as well because that's missing in the Western model. So we don't just throw out all of Western medicine because big farmers corrupt. Like so being completely contrarian is just as stupid as accepting everything from the mainstream model. So we need nuance and we need to find a balance between uh, different modes of well-being because that's how we're going to come up with a uh, a medical model that is holistic and benefits everyone in a good way. Thanks, Ben. Um, Kerry or Kat, do you want to do you want to respond to the future of permaculture and uh, medical system that um, withstands future pandemic or crisis? Um, yeah, I, I have a comment on that to make. And <laughs> the, the first comment is, um, there's that lovely quote, it's best not to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, so we, we don't know what will happen in the future. But, you know, let's assume that we do go through a sustained um, drop in the amount of energy that our society has to function with. There'll be a lot of conversations that happen, no doubt. And my bet would be that um, medicine and um, Western medicine is something that we choose to hang on to. <laughs> you know, there'll be so many other things that we decide are not essential before we start having to make changes to the way that we offer medical care. Um, and I think if anything, that kind of situation would make us just feel so much more grateful um, for the people and for um, those systems that are in place, notwithstanding the comment that Ben just made around some of the organisations involved at the global scale that are, you know, having, you know, quite a substantial um, negative impact in some cases. Uh, so I, I guess I don't, I don't share all of those fears, but I do think a lot about how um, the medical uh, the current medical system is reliant on a lot of disposable equipment that might become a lot more expensive or difficult to access. And I wonder how that's going to adapt over time. And I think we're, we're starting to see doctors pushing back a little bit and saying, well, can we, can we have washable gowns and washable face masks to deal with some of this, given that we might be living it for some years to come? And I'm also thinking a lot, and I don't have many answers at this stage, but about places where there already is essentially no functioning medical system, including in some of the refugee camps um, that I'm becoming a bit more connected to, where there is no water, let alone soap, um, and people are being told to try and wash your hands with ash because that's the only thing that 
is akin to soap that they have and there is really no way that they can maintain any kind of physical distancing. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm worried less about our Australian medical system and I'm worried a lot more about existing current crises around the world um, and, and just wondering how we can try and support them as a country that's in a relatively good situation. Absolutely, Kat. Um, I had the privilege of, um, um, on the first part of your comment, of working with the um, Nurses and Midwifery Association and they have um, an environmental collective there. And I got to meet lots of nurses and doctors and midwives and um, different staff that are doing sustainability initiatives in their hospitals and um, changing from within, um, department by department, like and being better with their waste, being better with their energy and being more reflecting on the disposable nature. So I've seen there is good stuff happening in hospitals and our systems now and trying to be greener mm -hmm. in terms of the international part. Um, yeah, we should be giving everyone the right to um, healthcare, um, every single person in the future. I think that's a great aim. Mm -hmm. Karen, would you like can to I, can I just follow up quickly on that, Lorna? One of the things I've been quite interested to watch over the last few years is how um, Cuban doctors um, coming from a society with a lot of resource constraints and limitations themselves have um, been going out uh, to other countries and training other doctors. And they've become internationally recognised and valued because they've uh, been trained within a, such a constrained system. And so they're a lot more useful than your average Western doctor who has been trained with a lot of equipment uh, that then finds them, themselves in a situation where a lot of that doesn't exist. So um, I think there are ways that doctors can learn to adapt a lot more to local contexts. And probably a lot of that learning is going to come from places that aren't Australia, where people have just had to become a bit more flexible uh, and, um, and, and adapt their craft to existing resources. Absolutely. Um, humans are smart and resourceful and when put under pressure can affect great change. Thank you, Kat. Carrie, do you have anything to add about um, um, medicine and energy um, in the future? Just that I would absolutely hope that we aren't going to lose the advances that have happened with regards to medical science um, and that I would have thought um, the closer we come to embodying the ethics of earth care, uh, fair share and people care, the better outcomes we're likely to actually have in terms of wellbeing. Um, you know, the, um, the egregious inequalities that we have throughout the world at the moment are definitely contributing to much worse um, in term health outcomes. Um, you know, and also the rampant environmental destruction is exposing all kinds of new different types of illnesses and diseases and exposing us to the pandemic threats that we're facing. So. Um, I certainly don't think it's 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 either or. Like one would certainly hope that th that that more positive permaculture direction could improve those outcomes and hold on to the best of the gains that we've made. Thank you, thank you, panel. And um, we've got a few questions left, and um, we've a few minutes left. So I'm going to um, pick a question, pick a panelist um, for the remaining ones, and then if you're dying to answer as well, I'll let you um, for the other panelists. Um, I have um, Alex Durans. Um, who had a question about um, engagement and how we better engage people that we've touched on a bit. Alex, I've thrown the mic to you. If you um, want to accept and ask your question, that would be great. Hello. Um, I think it's been touched on a bit already, but um, if anyone has any further ideas about how to include and engage um, people or communities who don't have financial access to things like um, permaculture design courses or even uh, propagation materials, resources, um, you know, the kind of people who traditionally um, are kind of at the mercy of food justice issues because it seems like permaculture would be a possible solution, but then how do we link that all up? Kat, over to you. Yes, <laughs> I'm happy to comment on that some more. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think this really needs to be a question that's front of mind with any permaculture project, which is not to say that people who are privileged shouldn't be a target of programs as well, because of course there are great benefits for the whole of society when more people pick up these habits. But yeah, I agree, um, it's an area to put a lot of focus on. Uh, my experience has been that you are most effective if you can partner with an existing organisation that's already got great networks into um, those communities. Um, many culturally and linguistically diverse communities and refugee communities do have quite strong networks within their own community, but they're often quite um, isolated and segregated from uh, other networks that include 
permaculture. So if you can find a contact um, within those groups and then train um, champions where possible who are natural teachers and then can go and share that work, that's often a great way of scaling up quite quickly. Uh, there's a, a lovely story out of the work that we did in Malaysia recently with a young refugee who's only about 16 or 17, but who is a teacher already within his community and um, had already done some great urban agriculture work. And by the time we left was starting to write a book on how to do urban permaculture in Kuala Lumpur um, within <laughs> his community. And um, it's now, as we speak, setting up uh, packs of seeds and plants to go and share with other people who are starting food gardens as a very real um, survival tool for the situation that they're in. So I think working through networks and um, working through champions and of course permaculture is uh, it's really strong in the sense that it encourages you to use what you've got and um, has a bias against the things that you've already got and waste materials rather than needing to go and buy tools and equipment. Uh, so just inherently permaculture's got some advantages um, to other styles of aid work and I think really focusing on um, using the things that everybody has access to in your strategies and techniques. So that would be weeds, rocks, um, rubbish and earth <laughs> and plants. Those, those are the building blocks for many of the um, food-based strategies and techniques in permaculture. So making sure that we consciously use those so that the things that we teach can then be replicated by anybody without needing special tools and equipment. Um, is that that's an area that I'll be putting a lot of focus on in the future. Fantastic, Kat. Thank you so much. Um, great answer. We have two questions left and I've asked the panellists, Kerry and Ben, to choose um, um, out of the questions. So just let me know who and I'll, I'll pass in the mic. Kerry and Ben? Um, I'll take Jodie's question. Hey Jodie, I'm, I'm handing you the mic if you'd like to read out your question. Hi everyone. Um, my question just has to do with um, seeing lots of people on social media using this situation as justification for hiding in their bunker with all their canned food and their guns. Um, and I'm really wondering how, you know, what's the best way to approach that and um, to really steer them more towards community resilience um, and sharing economies that would be more sustainable into the future. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Jodie. It's such an important question. Um, I'm not sure I have all the answers for it, except to emphasize just how, again, how, we, how central collaboration is to us getting ourselves out of these crises. <laughs> Um, perhaps one way of approaching it might be to ask people who are prepping exactly how long that they think they could survive left completely on their own and left completely to their own devices. Um, you know, the only way of building true resilience into a system is building it together. Um, and the more inclusive that system is, I think, the more secure it is, the more resilient it is. Um, so, you know, I think it's a matter as always with these questions of reaching out to people, meeting them where they're at, um, talking to them about their motivations for engaging in um, that sort of prepper, prepping practice and maybe exposing them to some alternatives and the benefits of those alternatives. Um, hopefully expressing them in terms of values that you share. Um, you know, we, we don't wanna be in this zombie apocalypse mentality. Um, <laughs> that leaves us trapped in a bunker fighting off monsters. We need to be building a positive future together. Um, and, you know, we've seen all kinds of wonderful uh, uh, things happening in this space and working towards this, the viral kindness movement, um, you know, those little letterbox drops that you can do to help build a more connected neighbourhood. Um, you know, it's more likely um, that it's going to be your neighbour who saves you in the face of a real climate disaster or emergency than anyone else. So in terms, if you are really just concerned about your own survival, then um, it's really only going to be through your connections with others and building resilient communities. Thank you, Kerry. Um, a great response. I'm leaving, um, leaving the last question for you, Ben, and that's around um, politics, logging and um, the 
little guy and the big guy sort of idea. Um, if you, um, I'm going to um, go now to Rebecca Sweeney just to um, rephrase her question for you, and then we're going to round up for the day after the end of this question. Um, so I, hopefully, everyone has enjoyed the discussion so far, but I'll round out um, after Ben answers the last question for community. Thank you for your contributions, everyone, as well. Rebecca, the mic's been shared. Oh, hello. Thanks, everyone. I'm Sarah. It's Lorna, Kat, Ben, and Kerry. The uh, question I had was about uh, big power, I guess, to simplify it. And how do you, Ben's addressed it a bit, but how do you speak to uh, big power when they have the ear of the LNP government at the moment and people who are farming are ignoring permaculture and those ancient practices? And they're still favouring Monsanto and fertiliser uh, big money. Mm. Big question at the end. <laughs> yeah, it depends who your target is. If you're trying to target politicians, uh, then you need to demonstrate that there's a constituency around the idea that you're trying to push. Uh, so if there's no cost uh, for them of ignoring what you're saying electorally uh, or reputationally, then they're, they're not going to care. So you've got to got to create a cost for them by building alliances, uh, you know, across, you know, not just with people but with organisations and other allied movements that are likely to rally around that and demonstrate that there's a constituency for a cha for change. Uh, if your target is a business, but well, again, what kind of costs can you create for them? What kind of reputational damage or good reputational enhancement that they can get from adopting uh, what you're adapting. But either way, you as an individual or us as any one individual person have very little political leverage, which means we have to collaborate and coordinate and act collectively with each other and establish networks. So the bigger our networks are, the more political leverage we have. And you know, that meshes very well with what we're trying, the community building aspect of permaculture that we're, we're trying to do there. So permaculture is intensely political and being conscious of the, the political impact of what we're doing uh, can help to turbocharge that impact. Absolutely, and you rounded out lots of the themes of today do, too. Thank you, Ben. Like I've heard a lot about care, um, kindness and collaboration um, to help us through the crisis. Um, I'd, I'd like to, um, give a warm round of applause to our wonderful panel uh, of Kerry, Ben and Kat. What an amazing brain trust on, on this topic. And um, thank you so much community for engaging with this. Um, so thank you. Maybe you would like to say goodbye um, panelists and I'd love to see you next week for regenerative agriculture, same time, same channel. Um, thank you very much everyone. And thank you for um, starting our new webinar series with us. It's so exciting. Um, thank you, Kerry, Ben and Kat, please say a goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for organising and thanks everyone for coming. Bye. Thanks. Take care.